Welcome to Jason Live. We're back with our STEM career series. My name is Patrick Shea, and we're here to learn about careers in science, technology, engineering, and math from role models currently working in those fields. Today's STEM role model is Matt Brumbelow. You might recognize Matt. He's one of the featured researchers in Jason's terminal velocity curriculum. He works at the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety, and his research on car crashes helps make us all safer out there on the roads. We're going to learn about Matt's research and career path in just a moment. But before we do, just want to remind everybody out there that today's event is live and interactive. You can use the box just below this video window to send us questions and participate in our live polls. We'll uh, try to get as many of you involved today as possible. I know many of you have already sent in questions, so we're going to get started on that in just a minute. But first, let's welcome Matt. Welcome, Matt. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's really a privilege to be here. Okay, so um, we've got a lot of students out there who already know a lot about you and, and what you do from the Jason curriculum. But for everybody else, why don't you just kind of give an overview? Uh, what, what is it that you do there? Sure, yeah. I'm a research engineer at the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety. Um, that's really a mouthful. We usually just call it the Institute around here. Um, but our goal here at the Institute is to reduce the loss of life and prevent injuries um, that come from automobile crashes, um, unfortunately, every day on our, our country's roads. And so, um, as a nonprofit, we are sponsored by automotive insurance companies. Um, they um, supply us with uh, the money that we need to do um, the research that we're doing here. And so the most um, visible part of that work, and you see an example actually right here behind me from this morning, is that we have um, several crash test programs that we run here. And in these um, different kinds of crash tests, what we're doing um, is, is comparing vehicles that are um, available, that are on the market for every um, one to buy. Um, but we're, what we're doing is comparing them all to each other in terms of, of safety. And the specific word we use for safety in a crash here is crash worthiness. And the reason that we do this is because we think that people should be able to have this information when they're actually buying a vehicle. That if you want to buy a safer, a safe vehicle, you shouldn't have to <laughs> take your chances and hope you don't get in a crash, but that you can actually have this information ahead of time to help you make these decisions. And so um, that's the biggest, as I said, the most public part, visible part of what we do are these, these crash test programs for consumer information. But the reality is that's just one small piece of all the research that goes on here. And so um, my job personally as a research engineer is to look at different kinds of crashes that are happening in the real world and um, see whether we can make a difference in, in reducing the, the impacts, um, <laughs> no pun intended, of those crashes by um, whether it's just encouraging the, the best technology, doing studies that show the benefits of certain technology. Um, and then sometimes that does end up in a crash test program like the one that you see behind me here. It's fascinating and, and very important work. And we're going to get into all of the details of that through our questions today. We actually have a video question that's going to kick us off. And here it is. Stand by. Hi, I'm Vangel. And I'm Jake. And uh, we read your book as you see there, and we both have a question. My question is, what kind of cars do you crash? And my question is, what's your favorite kind of car to crash? And it would be awesome if you could answer it. Mm -hmm. Hi. I'm Good question. So um, the first one, what kinds of cars do we crash? Um, short answer is every kind. We try to cover as much of the fleet of vehicles that are on the road as we can, um, but our limitations are essentially time and and the money that we have because we're buying all these vehicles off the dealership lots. We want to get the exact same vehicle that that you would buy 
um, or your parents would buy. And so to make those decisions, we're looking at vehicle sales numbers as well as price. And those usually go pretty well together. The most expensive vehicles usually have low sales. So the benefit of testing those cars is, is smaller than the more popular ones. Um, as far as what uh, my favorite type of car to crash would be, this might sound strange um, to say, but in, as you're watching the crashes, there's really not much to distinguish them in, in real time. It all happens so quickly um, that by the time it's over, you, can, <laughs> you really have to go back and look at this slow motion video to figure out what happened. So I wouldn't say I have a favorite t kind of car to crash. My, the most interesting tests to me are the new, the new crash test programs when they come out because um, it's a brand new test. We're not sure how the vehicles are going to do, and there's just a lot more um, uncertainty when we actually conduct a test to see what's going to happen. So I want to pick up on one of the things that you just said. You said you, you actually buy the cars off the lots. Does the Institute actually purchase the car? Or are they donated by the, the companies to, to see how they do in the tests? We, we do actually buy the vehicles off the lots. And again, the reason for that is we don't want to get a special um, Institute version of the vehicle mm -hmm. that we're testing. We want to get the exact same thing that anyone else would buy. Um, so that is, that's a big chunk of our budget each year is just the money that we need to go buy the cars. Very interesting. Uh, we've got another video question next. Let's see what they have to ask. We know that people don't drive the cars when you're experimenting, but how do the cars move without a person driving it? Yes, so our, we do have a dummy in the driver's seat. Unfortunately, the dummy is not um, smart enough to drive the car at the speed that we'd want him to. Um, instead, we have, it's a, a system of cables and pulleys that the vehicle's attached to, and so um, the car actually won't, the, the engine won't be pulling the car. Um, the, the transmission will be in neutral. The car is attached to a cable, and we pull it at the speed that we want to test it. And then at the very last split second, just in the last um, foot or two, we release the car so that it's actually coasting when it runs into the barrier. We've got some video of that that's going to come up in just a second here. Um, but while we're doing that, I'm going to launch into our first text question of the program. And this comes from Rodolfo. Uh, he asks, as a mechanical engineer, do you design and build a lot? Now, we we've, we talked to a lot of different types of engineers on this program. We know there are a lot of different types and different roles. Um, is that the kind of thing that you do in your role? Yes, that is a, that is a really good question. And uh, typically, the answer for a mechanical engineer would be yes, or um, mechanical engineers usually are designing a product. Um, and, and building those products. But my role here is it kind of straddles between engineering and research. And so what I'm doing as an engineer is actually testing other people's products. So other engineers have designed the car that you see behind me, for example. Um, but then it's our job here to see whether those designs are effective. And so it's it's not a typical what you would think of as an engineering job. There's a lot of research that is built into it. Our next question from Tom. Is there any area of science other than physics involved in crash testing? Wow, that's a good question. Um, physics is, is certainly the most common, um, the, the widest area of science that we'd be using. And here um, at... At the Institute, I would say probably just the electrical components that go into our, um, our sensors and, and the measurements that we're taking, you know, that would be a big part of it. Um, but as in terms of, again, uh, the mechanical engineers or the other types of engineers that, that design a car, there would be um, chemical engineers, for example, and how an airbag works and the, the chemicals that are combining in order to expand the airbag and come out in time to um, reduce the impact. So in designing a vehicle for 
um, crashworthiness, there would be a lot of other different kinds of science that are going into that. Makes sense. Tony wants to know, what does your work environment look like? We, we see a little bit of it there behind you, but um, it, this is a pretty unique facility, isn't it? Yes, it is very unique. Um, we have, it's a huge space that, that we have in order to conduct these crash tests indoors. Um, we have, um, there you can see we can actually fit a tractor trailer in this room where I'm sitting right now. Um, and then opposing on each side from what this room we call the crash hall, we have um, 200 meter long runways that the vehicle will accelerate um, from or through the runway and then enter the crash hall. And so in terms of <laughs> the square footage per employee, it's a pretty high number. <laughs> um, there's about 35 of us that work here, but I do spend most of my time at a desk um, looking at the data from the crash test as well as uh, real world crash data. Um, a lot of that is online now. A couple of related questions uh, from Ms. DeMaio's second grade class and, and from Tom. Uh, what are some of the tools you use to crash the cars and what technology do you use to fling a car and make it crash? <laughs> That's great. Um, the, the tools, so I described a little bit of our the pulley cable system. That would be an example of a tool, um, but the dummy itself is really a tool that has a lot of different components to it. So we need, um, because we don't want, <laughs> again, a real person in the vehicle when we're testing it, but we need a tool that will behave as close to a real person as possible. And so built into that dummy are sensors that allow us to measure forces, accelerations, even deflections of chest, uh, ribs, for example. Um, that that's one example of a tool. Another one I haven't um, mentioned yet, besides this indoor space, we have outdoor test tracks. And more and more of the research we're doing is overlapping into what's called active safety, which is really just a phrase to mean technology that's designed to prevent a crash from happening in the first place. And so we will, these, these are vehicles that are using radar or um, laser sensors, different kinds of sensors to pick up on the environment of the vehicle and try to prevent a crash from happening. So on the test track, we have a whole other set of tools that we're using to measure position and speed of vehicles and how these sensors really are responding to and whether they're doing what they're supposed to do or not. We have a bunch of questions related to the dummies. People are very interested in, in those. Um, Madeline wants to know, how do we get information from the crash test dummies and how do they work? Yes, yeah, so the, the dummies uh, mentioned they have a whole bunch of sensors. They're measuring um, forces on the head, on the neck, acceleration um, in the chest, deflection of the ribs, even um, how much the knees um, deform if they um, get hit in a crash, the forces on the leg. So that's a lot of a lot of data because the crash happens so quickly. We're recording um, this data and at the frequency of of that data recording is 10 kilohertz. So 10,000 um, samples per second that we're recording the data. So that's a whole bunch of numbers that we need to then be able to look at later. So to do that, all those sensors are hooked up um, essentially to like a flash memory inside the dummy. And during the crash, all of that data is being recorded um, and saved for us inside the dummy. So as soon as the test is over, we can connect to the dummy um, wirelessly and download all that data in order to look back in time and see what actually happened when the vehicle ran into the barrier, when the dummy's head um, hit the airbag, and we can interpret all of those numbers after the fact. Mm -hmm. A couple more dummy-related questions. Pranav asks, how does the impact on the crash test dummies tell you what happens if, you know, if a human was in the seat at that time? Uh, and Kaylee wants to know, how do you know if crash test dummies react the same as humans would? 
Wow, those yeah, really good questions. Um, so the first, the to the first question, how do we know? Say we measure a certain force on the dummy's chest. How do we know it would happen to a real person? And this is kind of a gross side of maybe how this research happens. So we don't do this testing here, but a lot of other researchers, especially at universities, do testing with cadavers. So they're they're taking dead people and putting forces on different parts of the body, and then they're able to measure, you know, how much force can a human take without, for example, fracturing a rib or your skull. And then once they um, conduct those experiments, we now have that whole set of data to compare back to our dummies. So we can measure the force on the dummy and say, based on these sets of cadaver tests, this is roughly 20% risk of uh, a rib fracture, for example. Um, so that's how we um, correlate it back. This, I think the second question was, how do we know the dummy's responding like a human? And um, it's kind of similar. So tests with cadavers or even sometimes human volunteers at very low speeds with very low acceleration, so they're not getting injured, but then measuring um, at this acceleration, how is a real person moving? And wow. how does that change if... You know, I'm bracing for the crash or my neck is stiff versus I'm not expecting it. So we can do all of these comparisons and constantly go back and see, does the dummy do the same thing that a human being does? Very interesting. Um, Julia has our next question here. Do you have different age groups of dummies like babies, teens, and adults? And uh, actually, those are both from Julia. <laughs> so uh, do, you, do you test on just adults or all kinds of dummies? Yes, we do have several different sizes of dummies, and those do they range from um, three-month-old infants all the way up to the biggest dummy we have. It's called a 95th percentile male dummy, which means that it's bigger than 95% of U.S. adult males. Um, but those most of those dummies we would use only in very specific cases where say for example we want to test a um, a child restraint we would use one of the the child dummies but for the normal crash test programs that we're running most of the accepted um, dummies that have been studied the most are adult size dummies a big part of that is just because the driver um, seat position is what we're usually evaluating but for our side impact test we do use a smaller dummy, both in the driver's seat and then in the left rear seat. And that dummy represents a, a small um, fem U.S. adult female, but also a teenager. So teenagers of a, a certain age range would have the same size um, as that dummy that we use in our side impact test. We're going to uh, jump to a question here from Kate. She wants to know how, you know, you do all of this stuff. How do you take this information and then rate the car's safety? Yes, so we, get, we have a lot of data that we're looking at. We get it from um, the dummy, but we also take measurements of the vehicle structure and so how it deforms in, in the crash. The goal is that all of that deformation um, that's... It needs to happen in order to absorb the energy of the crash, but we want it to happen away from the, the passenger space. We, we want to see that occupant compartment preserved and, and kept intact. So we combine the, the readings from the dummy with measurements that we're taking of the vehicle structure. And, and the last component is the dummy sometimes <laughs> just gets lucky that we we see it move in the video in a certain way. It comes really close to hitting its head, but just barely misses. Well, we have a way of evaluating the, motion, the movement of the dummy to say, this isn't actually safe, even though um, he barely missed a, a bad injury. And so we combine all these things together and give the vehicle a rating. Now, as I mentioned, we have several different crash tests. So we're doing this for two different frontal crash tests, a side impact, a roof strength test, a rear impact um, whiplash prevention test, and 
because that all gets confusing to, to keep straight, we have something called the top safety pick, which is really selecting the vehicles that do well in all of the testing that we conduct here. You just, I think, kind of alluded to Jack's question here. What are the different scenarios that can happen when you crash a car? A question that we're always looking at, and in fact, that is a big part of my job, is to go back to the, the crash data in the real world and look at the wide range of, of impacts that happen to people, because we're... Um, limited in the number of tests we can do, we have to select a certain condition. And also because we want um, the results to be repeatable and comparable from one car to the next, we have to run exactly the same way each time. Uh, and so to do that, we're trying to pick some of the, what we've identified as the more common scenarios and also the ones that might be um, present the greatest risk in certain situations. And, um, but as I mentioned, frontal, it, the way we kind of break it down is what part of the car um, had to absorb the energy of the crash. So is it the front, front structure of the vehicle? You have a lot of space there that you can work with. Is it the side portion of the vehicle? There's much less space that can absorb the energy of the crash in that scenario. Is it a rollover crash, and so it's the roof that um, really needs to be strengthened to improve the, the crash worthiness. So we're constantly asking those questions and, then, and also trying to figure out if we should be doing different crash tests that would cover more of what's happening in real life. Mm -hmm. A couple of related questions here from Don and Kayla. What's the worst kind of car crash? And in a crash, what part of the car is the most vulnerable and which is the safest seat to sit in? Yes, so um, the worst kind of car crash, I think there's so many different um, factors and variables that go into what the outcome in a, in a crash. So generally, if, as I said, if you're hitting something with the front of your car, you have more space there that's designed to absorb the energy. But uh, an exception to that would be uh, the trailer underride test that um, you saw pictures of, and actually that was featured in, in the JSON materials. So in these crashes, that front portion of, of the vehicle that's designed to absorb energy is, is going underneath the trailer. And if that um, guard that's designed to engage that structure doesn't do its job, then now you're left with a very bad situation. So um, this is a, a test we don't do often, but it's one, it's actually in already being successful at encouraging the manufacturers of the trailers to redesign their guards in a way that um, prevents underride from happening. Um, besides that, I would say rollover crash is a very um, dangerous situation scenario to be in. Um, fortunately, again, it's improving, um, both because we have a roof strength test that um, has done a lot to improve the structure of, of vehicle roofs, but also because of something, an active safety technology called electronic stability control that is reducing the risk of getting in a rollover crash by up to 75%. So all of these technologies working together are really addressing all kinds of crashes. But again, we're constantly going back to look at that um, picture and see if we're missing something. Mm -hmm. A couple of related questions here about your job. Uh, Delaney wants to know, what's the hardest part of your job and why? And students in Mrs. Bounds class want to know, What's the most interesting part? Yes, um, the hardest part of my job. I'm not sure I've tried to, <laughs> to think about that before, but probably I'd say a common challenge, well, a challenge I frequently face is just the reality of what it is that we're doing. We're working with um, crash test data, but also real world crash data. And these are these are crashes where real people, people's loved ones have lost their lives or have been seriously injured. And to keep that um, goal in view, 
sometimes can be difficult just because you're looking at numbers all day and and types of crashes and how many and the percentages and what we should be doing and to just to I guess not lose sight of the fact that this is important and it's important because these numbers represent people just like you and me. Um, I th what, the second question was about um, um, the, most the most interesting, interesting part. part. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think for me just the way the, the thing I enjoy about my job is just the variety of the work that I get to do and it's I am someone who easily gets bored with doing <laughs> the same thing over and over and over again. Um, thankfully, there are people that are able to do that and do it well and get um, satisfaction from that because we need those kinds of people too to do the, the testing that, that we conduct here. But for me to have the variety of, okay, I'm looking at, I did a project on rollovers and um, once we had our roof strength program up and going, I get to move on to frontal crashes. And then when that's done, actually right now the biggest thing I'm looking at is um, headlights and how new headlight technologies that are able to, um, to swivel based on the curve you're going through at nighttime to light up that curve, what effects those are having and how might we be able to design a test that would encourage those Im kinds of improvements. So for me, just the variety is what keeps things interesting. So speaking of the variety, Santiago wants to know, what's your favorite experiment that you've done and what would you like to do in the future? And you know, Maria has a question about kind of the outcome of this research. Is it hard to, to take what you've learned and make the cars better? Because it's not you making the cars, it's you're passing this information along to the manufacturers, or, or is it hard to convince them to make these changes? Yeah, um, I'll take that second one first. I think um, initially, and I wasn't here at, at the very beginning when this facility was built and the Institute started giving crash test ratings, but initially that was a big question mark, was will manufacturers make changes and in, um, early on there some were very willing to make changes some um, <laughs> gave a lot of pushback on that but what really makes the difference is that people consumers um, are paying attention and so if we weren't able to communicate the results of our tests effectively or if the information was hard for people to get access to then probably manufacturers would have, well, definitely, they would have less incentive to redesign the vehicle. But um, as part of the reason we have just the technology in place to get really good images, video from the crash tests that we run is so that when you on, <laughs> when you're looking for a new car and you go online, the video is is compelling and appealing and it really drives home the point and so you're able to then make a better decision based on that mm -hmm. um, and as we've existed longer and gotten better at communicating gotten better at conducting crash tests now manufacturers they're not just responding to the tests that we're doing they're also for example this headlight test um, constantly coming to me i don't even have don't know the details yet of what a test might look like, but they already want to be designing for it and building it into their future design. So now we have a great relationship with the manufacturers. We invite them to come observe all the tests. We always will meet with them if they want to talk about it, and they get back um, very quickly with changes to their vehicle. That's great. We're going to take one last question here in this segment. And these are uh, students at Forestville Elementary School. Do you ever test anything other than cars, for example, motorcycles or trucks? Yes, um, we have not conducted any motorcycle crash tests here. Um, there are, um, well, actually, motorcycle manufacturers do conduct some of these tests. Um, we do research on motorcycle crashes, and um, that research alone we feel is fairly compelling to make the point that motorcycles are less safe than cars but there are still things that could be done 
technology-wise to make them safer. For example, um, some motorcycles now have airbags, and so crash tests that will um, rate those, but we haven't done any here. The, the trucks, the, the tractor trailers, um, as I mentioned, that is something we've looked at, and we've, we're continuing that research program because we've found that um, trailer manufacturers can't and generally conduct these crash tests themselves. And so we're actually giving them information that they wouldn't have otherwise on their design, and then they're able to incorporate that and make changes. All right, we're going to move along now. We've talked a lot about the work that you do currently as a mechanical engineer there, but we want to know how you got to this point. So our first question to take us there is from Kate. When did you first decide to be a mechanical engineer? Yes, yeah, so I didn't really ever know what being a mechanical engineer really meant um, until I started doing it. Um, so I think just in school, having people you know, tell me I enjoyed science, I enjoyed math, um, having people say, well, you should think about engineering, that was kind of okay. I don't really know what that means, but I'll you know, at least... You know, give it a shot and see. Um, but it wasn't, it, unfortunately, even in college of getting an engineering degree, I didn't fully, um, I wasn't able to imagine exactly what that would look like in a way that aligned with things that I feel like I'm good at or the way that I work. For example, ha needing this variety and wanting to be able to see the big picture. And so, um, in many ways, it was only as I started doing this this job and realizing um, really the research side more of you know, there are these questions we don't know the answer to. And it's just exciting to be able to look at those questions and try to come up not just with the answer, but the whole process of getting to the answer um, is something that I, I never really knew I would enjoy so much. And it's it's what I appreciate actually about the, the Jason project is um, giving people, kids, while you're in school, the chance to actually see what does this look like in real life? Because I think that was something that was missing for me, and I really could have benefited from it. For me as well, actually, when I was <laughs> in school, which is why I like doing this. Um, Next couple of questions. Uh, Sophie asks, have you, ever, have you always been interested in math and science? I think you just touched upon that, but if there's anything else you want to add. And Owen wants to know, do you have to be really, really good at math to be a mechanical engineer? <laughs> um, I don't think I'm really, really good at math, so I hope, I hope the answer is uh, no. But really... I think that goes back to the previous question is my the my conception of what it looks like to be an engineer when I was in school is that you know you're studying all of these different things and you're trying to keep them all straight and you're trying to you know remember you know what did I study last week for this exam or even a month ago and it it can start to run together but in real life jobs, almost everyone is specializing way more than what you're doing when you're studying. And so uh, if really, really good means you know every kind of thing about math that you've studied and are able to remember it, the answer is no. You just figure out what you need to know for your job, and then by practice and using it you know, over and over and over again, you become good at it. Good advice. Um, Amaya wants to know, what was your first job? And uh -huh, related, what were some of your previous jobs before you became a mechanical engineer? And why did you choose to change? Yes. Um, m this is my first full-time job. Um, so straight out of, of school, um, I, I felt like, as I mentioned, um, didn't really wasn't crazy about the idea of being an engineer, but I wanted to use my hands, and I felt like um, just the ability to work on something and learn as I, in a hands-on way, was something that appealed to me. And so, um, actually, I said this was my first job. I started at the Institute, but it was in a different capacity and more of just the technic um, technical side of things, working with the 
the cars, getting them ready for the, the crash test, working with the dummies, um, doing dummy calibrations. But it was through that process that I um, just started having my eyes opened a little bit to what research really looks like. And so I'm, um, you know, that the technical part I definitely benefited from because now I understand what goes into a crash test way better than I would have otherwise. Um, but it was only really by um, kind of trial and error and figuring out that um, this, you know, there are these, again, these research questions. We don't know even how to answer them. Let's try something out and see if it works mm -hmm. that I discovered that that's what I wanted to do. Brianna and Allison both have pretty much the same question here. What other science-related career would you have pursued if you didn't do what you're doing now? Yeah, um, as far as given my um, path to get here, it is it's difficult to say um, what where I would be otherwise. I'm and just for that reason, just very thankful that. I was given the opportunities I was and allowed to kind of grow into um, the the role and the position that I have now. So I honestly, maybe I'm unimaginative, but it's hard for me <laughs> even to speculate what where I might it's, be otherwise. It's, it's alternate universes. Right. Uh, Devin wants to know, who is your hero, the person that inspired you? Yes, um, there are a lot of people that I look up to. I put on, you know, on the little Q and A thing on the website. My wife is an example of someone that I really admire and and respect just for the work that she does every day, and being with our kids. And it's not glamorous. I mean, my job can seem glamorous. I don't. It's probably not as glamorous as people think. Um, but just how she's serving people and and doing it um, in such a great way. Um, here, I think at the institute, there's there's several people I work I look up to, and some of them are just my um, bosses and supervisors that have again allowed me to kind of explore and learn um, as I go along, and not be you know so confining and restraining that I feel like. You know, I'm, I just need to push back against it. And so I think that takes um, really some some courage on their part to let me um, figure things out as I go. And so I, I respect them for that, for sure. All right, we're going to move on again. Uh, next up, it's time for our polls. You've been asking Matt all these great questions, and now it is his turn to ask you some questions of his own. We're going to go to our first poll question right now. What country did Matt live in during middle school? Is it A, Mongolia, B, Kenya, C, the United States, or D, Italy? Matt lived in one of these countries. Uh, we haven't talked about it today. I guess this didn't, didn't come up yet in conversation, but um, if you have read Matt's responses online, you might know the answer. So we're just going to give you guys out there a couple of seconds more here to enter your responses into our poll calculator. Um, I can see that 43% right now think it's A, Mongolia. And Italy <laughs> is in second place. USA third. Uh, actually, USA and Kenya are now tied for third with 15%. Um, Matt, why don't you tell us what the right answer is? Yes, so Kenya B is the right answer, and I'm somewhat disappointed I had a throwaway <laughs> option of Texas in there because <laughs> I did. I, I, I switched I, that out. I didn't want to. Yeah. I know a lot of Texans think it's, it, it's already its own country, but uh, right. we, we try and to keep it clear. The, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I lived in Texas and um, was very proud of that fact for a while, that it was independent at some stage. But the right answer <laughs> is Kenya B. So what, what were you doing in Kenya? Or why well, so were you in Kenya, I guess? Yeah, when I was 11 years old, we moved from Texas to Nairobi, Kenya. Um, my parents, they're working with the church group there. My dad actually is a pilot, um, and he was flying all not just in Kenya, but all over East Africa. Um, in support of the group that we're working with, um, transportation, um, 
all comes back around, right? Yeah, right. The transportation there is very different than here, um, to say the least. Unsafe um, in more extreme ways than we describe it as unsafe here. Um, but also, just logistically, it's very difficult to move people and medicine and mail and food around. And so and that's what he did um, for the time that I was in Nairobi, was to help um, by flying around East Africa. Very cool. Uh, we're going to jump to our second poll question here, just aware of the time. Matt's research has contributed to which type of IHS crash test? Is it A, trailer under eyed, B, front small overlap, C, roof strength, or D, all of the above? I know we've talked about a couple of these if not all of these already today. So um, let's see. We've got responses coming in. The early leader is all of the above. A few folks think trailer underride. We've definitely talked about that. But um, that all of the above seems to be holding up. Matt, is that the right answer? It is, yes. And that it just gets back to the variety of things that we do here and how nobody is really locked into one kind of, um, of crash mode even that we get to all work on these different things together and it's something I really appreciate and enjoy about my job. All right. Question number three. What type of tool does Matt not regularly use in his job? Is it A, GPS with two centimeter accuracy? Is it B, a crash test dummy? Is it C, 500 frame per second digital camera? Or D, a radar gun? One of these Matt does not regularly use. Which one is it? Um, so far, Matt, in the lead is A, GPS with two centimeter accuracy. Um, and s there's a tie for second place between the digital camera and the radar gun. Uh, let's see. Yeah, everybody, and not everybody, but the 67% think it's A. Is that the right answer? No, actually, I do get to use that high accuracy GPS, and it's pretty incredible just to see um, how that all works and um, how repeatable it is. But so the right answer is the radar gun. Um, that's not something that we typically use. In fact, I'm not sure there even is one <laughs> in the building, <laughs> but yeah. All right, we've got time for just one more poll question here. Which word or phrase will you typically not hear spoken at IHS? Uh, is it A, acceleration, B, acceptable, C, accident, or D, anthropometric test device? Um, and while our audience is answering. Um, Matt, why don't you define anthropometric test device for us so we, we know what we're guessing. <laughs> <laughs> sure. That's a fancy way of saying crash test dummy. Okay. So anthropometry is just um, human proportions and dimensions, and so it reflects the fact that our dummy is representing a human in its size. Well... People are not guessing that one. They think you use that word typically at IHS. The one that they don't think you use is acceptable. What's the right answer? The right answer is C, accident. So acceptable is um, the reason I picked that one is it's a rating for our crash test. We have this um, four, four different categories, good, acceptable, marginal, and poor. So acceptable gets thrown around a lot. Um, but we won't typically say accident, and uh, that's an intentional thing, is we see these as crashes that happen, and if you think of them a certain way, and in terms of it, it being an accident, you can really communicate that there's nothing that could have been done to prevent this from happening, that it was just uh, unavoidable, it was, a, it was an accident, but... The reality is every crash has so many things that go into it that probably any single one of those, if they had been addressed at the right time and in the right way, could have prevented that crash from happening. So it's not an accident. And as scientists, we're trying to figure out 
what those factors were, and then what can we do to try and eliminate them and prevent the crash from happening or the injury from happening. Yeah, that is a, that's a very interesting kind of mindset that, that you should be in there. So um, we actually just have a few minutes left, and, and in that time we're going to try to answer as many more questions as we can. Uh, these This next set of questions is focused on the future. Um, Matt, you mentioned having kids. And uh, this next question here, if I can frame it up. Um, I cannot. I'll just tell you <laughs> what the okay. question is. The question is from uh, Brianna, and she wants to know, do you think that when your kids grow up that uh, they would like to try to do what you do? Wow. Um, they may. I'm not sure that they'll <laughs> be able to exactly. I'm sure there will be similar things for them to do but something that's really exciting about this field right now is just how fast the technology is changing and so mentioned active safety technologies that are using um, radar and laser sensors and light sensors to prevent crashes from happening and I'm um, sure people have heard about Google's you know self-driving car project that is the direction things are going and so I think there will be still research um, related to highway safety, but it's going to look pretty different by the time my kids are at the age where they'd be interested. And I'm, I wonder, you know, what will it even look like when they're trying to, if, will there be such a thing as a driver's license? It might be very different hmm. um, based on the type of car that, and the features that it has that by the time they're 15 or 16 years old. Well, that, that's a nice lead into our next question here from students in Ms. Bounds' class. If, uh, if they're interested in becoming a mechanical, en mechanical engineer, what advice would you give them? Yeah, just um, generally for the mechanical engineer part, so not um, specific to what I do, but it applies for sure, is just take things apart and as much as you can figure out what goes into a system, into a machine, or whatever you can take apart and figure out how does this work, and then try to put it back together. I think you know those are things that I enjoy, still <laughs> enjoy doing, um, and it just helps you start thinking through things in a, a completely different mindset and spatially how all of these components go together and work. So that's one piece of advice that I would give. Well, um, that is unfortunately the last piece of advice you're going to be able to give on this <laughs> program because we have uh, we've already gone over time, had so many great questions and so many great answers from you today, Matt. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time and, and teaching us about what you do there at IHS. You're welcome, and thanks again for having me and for all the great questions that you guys sent in. All right. We look forward to keeping in touch, and um, you know, you'll always be in that Jason curriculum, so we'll <laughs> always be keeping an eye on your work. Um, well, tell you make revisions, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that one, I think, is going to stay the same for a while. <laughs> I do want to uh, let folks out there know that our next STEM role model event is in a couple of weeks. It features glaciologist Twyla Moon. Twyla works at the National Snow and Ice Data Center, and she studies the ice sheets of Greenland and Antarctica. Uh, both of those ice sheets are shrinking and are the main contributors to the rise in sea level around the world. Twyla combines data from satellites with data she collects during expeditions to Greenland and Antarctica uh, to better understand the impact of these changes. We're going to learn about all of that and uh, Twyla's career path during our live event on Thursday, October 23rd at 1.30 p.m. Eastern. Um, again, that's all the time I have for Jason Learning. I'm Patrick Shea. We'll see you next time on Jason Live.